Isaiah 55 and verse 10. I'm going to read verse 10 and 11 in the Bible there. <clears throat> All right, this is a good verse. Uh, this must be written from the Irish viewpoint because it talks about rain. Amen. It says, For as the rain cometh down, just in the same way that rain comes down, as the, and as the snow from heaven, and returneth not hither. You've never seen rain go up. Okay, you've never seen snow go up. All right, just as rain comes down and snow comes down, but, it, but his purpose is to water the earth and maketh it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So there's a purpose for rain, purpose for water coming out of the sky. Verse 11, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish. I want you to understand those, those uh, underline those words. It shall accomplish that which I please and it shall prosper in the thing we're into. I send it. And the truth is, the Bible is going to accomplish what nothing else ever could. We've, we've tried to learn that this month. It does something. It has a power that works in anyone who will read it, who will believe it, and who will do it. Why? Because it is not the words of men, but they are the words of God. Last week, I've showed you three of the six things you need to do with your Bible. All right? Some people say, all I need to do is buy one. All I need to do is carry one. No, no, no. There's some, that, that's not even the beginning of what you should do with the Bible. I told you last week you need to read it. That sounds so simple, but many have never. The longer we go into the 21st century, the fewer and fewer people have ever read anything from the Bible. Oh, yeah, they read little snippets about the Bible. And they hear people talk to them about the Bible. They've never read it with their own eyes. Isn't that kind of strange? The true conspiracy is that people don't know the truth. The truth is in the Bible. The truth isn't found on the Internet. The truth is found in a book that you can get for a euro, and you can open it up and see for yourself what God says and what he thinks. Um, so there, I showed you four supernatural things that happen as you read the Bible. Then we learn that what happens when you study the Bible and you take it to another level. And boy, there are greater blessings. There's a greater effect on you. And then I began, I just started to talk to you about what happens when you start to believe it. Now, you see, the devil doesn't mind you having a Bible, doesn't mind you reading the Bible, doesn't even mind you studying it as long as you don't believe it. Because that's when you change. That's when everything about you becomes different than the rest of the world. Anybody's allowed to have a Bible. Anybody's allowed to read the Bible, but don't believe it. Too many people will think that if I go to church, I'm okay. You got to understand the devil doesn't mind you going to church. The devil doesn't mind what religion you're in. It doesn't matter at all what God you want to worship. As long as you don't worship Jesus Christ passionately from the heart, as long as you don't do it the Bible way, that is what defeats him. So I talked to you, I began to talk to you about believing the Bible. Now, this, this morning, I want to show you the last three. I want to show you that there are three more things you need to do with the Bible. Not just read it, not just study it, not just believe it, okay? But you need to obey it, okay? Uh, the Bible says, be doers of the word and not hearers only. That's our theme verse for the whole year. Doing the Bible, obeying, these are not these words are not suggestions, okay? These are like rules of the road that we all had to read and almost memorize before we got on the road because they're not suggestions. If you, you, Number one, if you want to live, but number two, if you don't want to get a ticket, you're going to have to obey the rules of the road. And if you want to live any kind of life, and if you want to get to where you get to go to heaven, you're going to have to obey the gospel and obey the rest of the Bible, man. It's just, it's a book to be obeyed. If you want sanity, then I want you to learn that you don't just, all right, I'm obeying the Bible, good. But I want to teach you, and this is something we'll be learning later on in the year, is how to use the Bible. Use it. And then I'll finish up with waiting on it. There are times when you've, you've read the Bible, studied the Bible, learned the Bible, you've memorized it, you've got a scripture, you believe with all your heart, but it's not working. That's when you learn to wait. You say, Lord, if your word works, then I'm going to trust it. Now wait as long as I have to. You may have to wait 30 years before somebody gets saved. 
You may have to wait 20 years before somebody gets their life right. You don't know, but you know that the Bible says what it says and you believe it enough to wait for it to finish the work. So we're going to talk about those three things this morning. But I want to start, I, I, I was going to dive right into those last three, but I thought, you know, there's, there's something about believing I want to emphasize. Because this is where it really matters. As I said a moment ago, you, you may read the Bible, and I know there are people who are, who are as lost as the chair you're sitting on, as the couch you're probably sitting on. They, they are as, as wicked as hell, but they read the Bible. You know why, they, why nothing's happened? Because they don't believe it. They'll read about it and they'll mock it. They'll make fun of it. They'll go through the motions and it never reaches the heart. I'm telling you, you got to believe this book. And by the way, let me just say a word of warning. If you do not get this truth, you don't learn that you're, there's some things you need to do with the Bible. The devil's going to convince you to believe only in scientists. And I hope by now you realize they don't know what they're saying either. The, world, the devil will convince you to believe evolutionists, that we all came from rocks and from apes and from amoeba. Magicians, you know, some people believe in the power of a magician when it's a sleight of hand. They believe in priests and YouTube liars. The devil gets you to believe me mainstream media and televangelists and snake oil salesmen. You see, if you don't believe the truth, you'll fall for anything. The greatest event that is happening right now at this very moment is somebody's got the guts to tell you the truth from the word of God so that you don't get deceived. And no wonder I'm not popular or the most watched person on YouTube is because people don't care whether they get the truth or not. But I'm going to preach it anyway. And the best gift you've got is that God brought you to this moment to watch and hear what God says, not what Craig or what anybody else says. So let's look at this first thing again. I want to talk to you about believing the Bible because the power of the blessings of the Word of God begin with belief. Because as I said last week, it is the Bible that converts your soul. It's not lightning. It's not a feeling. It's not even a prayer. It is the belief in what God said. I've never seen Jesus. I've never been to Israel. I haven't been to the Jordan River. I've not seen any of that. But I've seen it all in the Word of God. And I've met John the Baptist. I've heard him preach with my own ears because I read it out loud, okay? <laughs> I heard Jesus Christ speak straight to me saying, I must be born again. As I read the Bible, I need to hear it enough to believe it. Now, you can believe whatever or whoever you want, but only one belief actually does any good at all. Take your Bible, turn to John. The Gospel of John chapter 3. John chapter 3. You know, honestly, if this was the only point I preached, it's enough. Because my whole job is to get you to believe. Not me. I don't want you to believe me uh, any more than, than uh, you know, believe the weatherman, okay? <laughs> I want you to believe what God said and what Jesus said. So look at your Bible, John chapter 3 and verse 15. Jesus is speaking. That whosoever believeth, notice those words, in him, in the Messiah, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have what kind of life? And it's by belief. Now, I know a lot of people believe in, you know, little green men. Uh, a lot of people believe there's life on Mars. A lot of people believe all kinds of crazy things. You can believe whatever you want. But only one belief does any good at all. And according to that, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you get eternal life. Verse 16. For God so loved you, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, anybody would believe just in him. Now, my mom, I'll tell you this, my mom is terrified of, of airplanes and flights and altitude and being up high. And there comes a time where you got to push through that fear, get in the airplane and trust the pilot, trust the plane. Now, after what happened yesterday, you hear about that plane I was <laughs> flying over Colorado, part of the engine fell off. I don't blame people not believing in the airplanes. But I'll be quite plain with you. You can believe in Christ enough to trust him and, and let him take you all the way home to heaven. He will not fail. Airplanes will, but not Jesus. Let me keep reading. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. But by belief, you get everlasting life. Go to John chapter 6. 
6.47. Verily, verily. Those are powerful words. Really, really, really listen, he's saying. I say unto you, he that believeth on me, that's when he has everlasting life. So believing this Bible does not make people religious, okay? It makes them brand new. We read that verse there in 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed. Your parents used corruptible seed, used human seed to produce your flesh. We're not born again by humans. We're born again by incorruptible seed, by un soiled seed by perfect seed and that perfect seed liveth and abideth forever that's the bible okay i'm born again by the word of god which liveth and abideth forever second corinthians 5 17 says if any man be in christ you say well i was baptized well you got in water that's the wrong direction well i'm in church that's the wrong direction turn to christ if any man gets into christ and that's by faith through the bible if any man be in christ He's a new creature. The Bible never says you must be religious. It's a good thing to be religious, but that's not what you must do. You must be born again by the word of God. Now, how does that happen? Romans, go to Romans chapter 10. How does a person get saved or changed, born again? Romans 10, verse 17 says this. Where do I get my faith from? A lot of people believe their faith comes from their church. Well, if you're getting your faith from your church, you, you've, got a, you've got an empty, dry well. Or if there's, if there's anything in there, it's way contaminated. You need to get it from the pure source, which is the word of God. Look at Romans 10, 17. It says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the. So I get it from the word of God. If you want faith, you got to get it from the Bible. That's why all I want to ever do is preach the Bible, because I want you to have faith. I want you to be able to know that you know that you know Jesus by the Bible. So this book converts a soul. And not just, uh, not just any old faith. I mean, you need to believe as best as you can. I remember the guy who led me to Christ. His name, was John, his name is John Cranford. He's still alive. <laughs> and John Cranford looked at me, and I said, all right, well, what do I got to do? He says, you need to believe as best as you can. There's no way to understand all this stuff. It would take 25 lifetimes to be able to master enough, enough of this theology to be able to say, I know God. I know this. All you need to do is be able to trust him as best as you know how and say, I believe. The uh, Ethiopian eunuch on the road uh, going home, he meets Philip and he's reading the Bible. He's reading out of uh, Isaiah 53. And Philip preaches unto him Jesus. And the eunuch says, all right, well, I'm ready to get baptized. And Philip says, no, oh, no, only if you believe with all your heart. And the Ethiopian eunuch stood up and said in that chariot, he says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Messiah. I believe he is who he said he is, and I trust him. That's when he took him down and baptized him. But look at that. The Ethiopian eunuch struggling through Old Testament, didn't hardly know anything about the New Testament. He just believed with all his heart. Can you believe? with just the heart you have? Could you just believe? Imagine you've fallen in love with somebody and, and uh, them ask you, yeah, but do you fully know me? Do you fully understand me? That's not what you're asked. You're asked, well, do, will you love me with all your heart? Do you love me with all your heart? Whatever, whatever you understand, do you love? That's what God asks us is, will we trust him, believe on him with all our heart? You, the open eunuch went home rejoicing because he was saved by the simple faith that he had, a childlike faith, Jesus said. So the book converts a soul. More than that, it confirms. This is breathtaking. Go to 1 John, back almost to Revelation. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 11. You don't need a priest. You don't need a bishop. You don't even need a pastor to tell you you're saved. This book confirms it. 1 John chapter 5. <clears throat> verse 11, First John 5, 11. And when it says record, it's not like the old style record player records. It's a written record, okay? And you're holding it in your hand. Look what he says, verse 11, 1 John 5, 11. And this is the record, the written record that God has given to us 
eternal life. And this life is found in his son. He that hath the son, what have you got? Hath life. And he that hath not the son of God hath not life. Verse 13 goes on. These things have I written unto you. The whole purpose of it being written. Unto you that believe on the name of the son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the son of God. Uh, no one would know. No one would know that they were saved without a Bible telling them so. Don't wait for somebody to tell you, are you saved? You need to be able to see with your own eyes. The Bible says if you just believe on Jesus, you have. I know too many Christians who are way too confused because they watch too much YouTube and they spend all kinds of different churches. And they say, well, I don't know if I'm saved. The only reason why they don't know if they're saved or not is because they're not reading their Bible. Because the Bible says, if you believe, you are. You, if you've got Christ, you've got eternal life. Isn't that wonderful? That Bible will confirm. You don't need to go to confirmation or have a second blessing or a laying on of hands or proof of something. No, you need to believe what God says that you're in. It also compels, and I love this point, because as I read the Bible, it pushes me, it motivates me. It actually, it, it, it empowers me. It admonishes and drives me. Go to Isaiah. Back to Isaiah. We were in Isaiah there a little earlier. Isaiah chapter 11, I'm sorry, 8. Isaiah 8 and verse 11. <clears throat> Isaiah 8, 11. Now, I don't know if you ever had anybody like this, but listen to the way God talks here. Isaiah 8, 11. For the Lord spake to me. Spake thus to me. All right, so far God's talking to a prophet. And he says, For Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand. And he instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people. Now watch this. All right? Without an illustration, I'm just going to, uh, you know, without somebody else, I'm going to just show you. When my dad wanted to make a point, he would put his hand on my shoulder, look me eye in the eye, and he says, Do you understand what I'm saying, Craig? And when he put his hand on my shoulder, it put all the impetus on me paying attention because he meant that what I was supposed to do, I was going to do, okay? And those words took on greater power when he put his hand on my shoulder, okay? It wasn't a loving touch. It was, you get what I'm saying, do you? Do you or don't you? And when the Lord puts that book in your hand, and when somebody preaches it or you're just reading it, the Holy Spirit will put his hand on your shoulder and says, do you get it? And there's a push there. See, the Bible's not supposed to make you feel comfortable. Yes, it encourages. Thank God. Yes, it comforts. Praise the Lord. But it pushes. It compels. It, it, it gets you moving. Um, uh, these words drive men forward into the unknown to do the impossible for God. You know what this book will do to you? If you'll just read it and believe it, it'll make a fanatic out of you. See, people say, well, pastor, that's just your life. No, it's the Christian life I'm living. I happen to be a pastor. But the life I live, I'm to be an example of the believer. My life is not the life only for Pastor Ledbetter because he's this upper theologian. Not at all. You've got to knock that out of your head and realize I'm supposed to be the normal Christian. And so are you. And when the Bible comes at you and starts to push you in a direction you don't want to go, welcome to the club. That's how the word works. It pushes us to become fanatics, to live like Jesus did, not like we feel doing. It propels men to go to faraway places and to give their lives and even die trying to win lost people who do not know God. You ought to learn about the lives of men like Jim Elliott and Nate Saint and Ed McCulley and Pete Fleming and Roger Yundurian who went to Ecuador in 1952, and in 1956, they all were speared by a, by a tribe that were called, they were called savages, and they killed them as they got off the airplane. They had been for months trying to open the door and give them the gospel, learn their language. And when they got off the, the, the little single-engine plane, and they came off, out of the woods came spears and killed every one of them on the spot. What would possess a man to go and risk his life? He was a married man. What would possess his wife? to go with a man to central 
uh, uh, to South America and uh, to Ecuador, Central South America, there and, and risk their lives. The word of God does. Did you ever hear of a guy named David Livingston? Jim Moffat talked to him and says, there are, uh, I have seen the, the, the smoke of a thousand fires of tribes that have never heard the gospel. And David Livingston went to South Central Africa and crisscrossed that place. The only reason why he wanted, anybody says, well, he went there to find the source of the Nile. Do you realize the only, there are two reasons why he wanted to find the source of the Nile. One, so that he could be heard by important men, so he could stop the slave trade. He said, if I can find that thing, I'll be in the halls of parliament and I'll be able to speak up and shut down the slave trade, which is what he, heard, what he spent his life doing. And the second reason was the word of God drove him to go and give the gospel all across Africa where nobody cared and God put in his heart to care. Jonathan Goforth, amazing missionary. I ought to read these names, biographies of these men. He went to China with the gospel in 1888. Tens of thousands of people have gone into the world and given their lives. You never hear about them. What drove them? The Bible. The, the Bible did. Do you know the same power that drove those men and those wives and those people all over the world and still do, that same power will keep your marriage together. That same power will keep your mind together. That same power will keep your family together. That same power will keep our society together. When we do not Believe this book, we're letting everything fall apart. Don't do it. And I find this, if young men today, and I get grieved over this, where are the young men? But if young men are not being compelled to be fanatics for Jesus Christ, I only have one answer, because they're not reading the Bible. They're not believing it. Because you, God doesn't make fanatics out of deadheads, out of lazy guys. You're never going to get on fire for God until you get into this book. Uh, these are the, the, the men who all gave their lives one day, and they're, they're, they're heroes because they obeyed the Bible, because the Bible pushed them to go to where it was risky to give the gospel to people who were going to kill them. Anyway, it revives me. It quickens me. We learned on Wednesday night, and you ought to join in on Wednesday night. We have a Zoom meeting. You ought to get the link and join in. You don't have to show your face. You don't even have to participate, but you'll learn a lot on a Wednesday evening as we go through Psalm 119. By the way, next Wednesday, not this coming Wednesday, but the following Wednesday, we've got our missionary to the Marshall Islands, David Fetter. So stay tuned. We're getting back in uh, some other of our missionaries. Hopefully, better Ed, Ed Pagali will be soon enough. But we learned on Wednesday night that um, uh, God revives you and can revive you. Bring back life to you through his word. Go to Psalm 119. Back to the left. Psalm 119. There's about six times in the book of Psalm, in, in Psalm 119 where it says, quicken me, quicken me. But here's one I'm, I wanted to show you here. Psalm 119, 107. Now you could be by health afflicted. You could be by mockery, by, you know, your enemies and supposed friends. You could be afflicted uh, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, demonic. Look at what the Bible says. I am afflicted very much. Well, I thought when you got saved, Pastor, you wouldn't have any more troubles. Well, I wish I could tell you that was true, but that's a lie. You see, the only difference between me and you is I have the word and I believe it and it helps me. Look at what it says. I am afflicted very much. Quicken me, revive me, O Lord, according to thy word. All right. So if you want to get revived, if you feel like I'm kind of lethargic, I'm kind of backsliding, and you know it when you are, you need to get in the Bible and say, God, according to this book, as I go through this book, bring life back to me. Bring life back to our church. Bring life back to our nation by your word. Uh, it also does something else. It'll calm you. It'll, it'll put your heart at rest. First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians, almost uh, to Hebrews. You'll find Hebrews, James, all that stuff. But just before Hebrews, there's a couple of little books and find First Thessalonians chapter 4 in verse 18. I love this. Just one little verse. Paul wrote a whole book. 
and uh, this little book here, First Thessalonians, and his whole purpose was this one thing, just like Philippians, but here's really cool, very simple. He says, wherefore, comfort one another with what? With these words. Now, I like it when somebody, Bible says, weep with them that weep. That's comforting, all right? No one needs to tell them anything. No one needs to say anything, just cry. Uh, sometimes just somebody just fixing a meal for them. That's comforting. But the Bible was written to comfort where nobody else can. So comfort yourself and comfort others with the God, with the word of God. Man, it'll encourage you. Uh, now, not every page is comforting. Get, get the truth. Sometimes it's correcting. But there's enough of that Bible that'll just thrill your soul and pick you up. It'll open. You know, as you read your Bible, you'll see there's a bigger picture. I was talking to somebody this morning talking about the parables. And those parables aren't about farmers. There's a bigger picture behind what Jesus was talking about in the parables, where he'd be talking about, you know, a, a sower going forth to sow the seed. And the, and, and the story behind the story, the, the, the bigger principle was it's not, the, it's not the preacher or the soul winner and the way that you, you get the Bible is how you receive it that matters. You might find the gospel on a gospel track. You may have a, a passionate wife who's begging you to please get saved. You may have a pastor who week after week preaches and begs you to get saved. It doesn't matter who's planting the seed. What matters is how do you receive it? So there's a bigger picture there. And when you start reading your Bible and you see all of the people and all the things going on, you get the bigger picture. God knows what he's doing and it comforts you. So that you may just go through a couple of years of, of valleys, shadows of death, because you know God's in control. Uh, you know, if we just believe it, I just had to emphasize, I could preach that every week and I don't think I'd ever get tired of telling you, believe it because the power starts in the believing Second thing, now let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 30. We'll get to the last three here. Deuteronomy, the fifth book of your Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 30. There's a power, there's a benefit, there's an effect in my life that comes as I obey the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 11. We'll read down to verse 14, Deuteronomy 30, verse 11. For this commandment, which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee. It didn't make it hard for you to get. Neither is it afar off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, who shall go up for us to heaven in a rocket and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. No, but the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest what? Do it. I, 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 I need to read it. I need to study it sometimes to try to understand what it's saying. Not only do I need to believe it though, but it was written so I do it. Jesus said, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? I mean, that's an obvious question. Go to Luke chapter 6. I want you to see it with your own eyes. Luke chapter 6. Luke 6 and 46. Luke 6, 46 says, get there. I mean, we call him Lord Jesus. That thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Well, here's verse 46. Why do you call me Lord? And yet do nothing that I say. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He's like a man which built his house and dig deep, laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon the house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. So he compares to a parable, a man believing enough of, of what Jesus said to obey it and to do it to a man who builds a house upon a rock. Now, next man builds his house upon something else, verse 49. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth and against which the stream did beat vehemently, the stream of water, and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. Why? Because he had, he had the word, 
He, he, he knew it. He may have understood it. He may have even believed it to be true, but he wasn't going to do it. You know, there's plenty. Most of people probably watching me today know that it's right to hand out a gospel tract to, to people and give them the gospel and compel people. They must be born again. They know it's right to, um, uh, to forgive when it's hard. They know it's right to pray about everything. They know it's right to abstain from the appearance of evil. They know about all that stuff, but they won't do it. So we get none of the blessings of the word of God. What happens when I start doing what it says to do? You know what happens? It'll start to change you. This is a revelation. You say, I'm reading my Bible, but nothing's changing. And that happens too often in Christian uh, marriages fall apart, not because two people don't have Bibles and not even because two people aren't saved. It's because neither one of them will do it. Look at your Bible. Go to Psalm 138. Psalm 138. Psalm 138 in verse 8. You know what the Bible's like? It's like a hammer and a chisel. We're the stone. And if you don't like what the Bible does to you, then you're in a good place because it's changing you. Uh, Psalm 138 in verse 8. I like this verse. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Aren't you glad he uses mercy on us instead of just justice? Uh, o Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the work of thine own hands. So he's saying the Lord is going to perfect that, finish that work. Well, how does God change us? Now I need you to go back to Psalm 119. Psalm 119 in verse 9. Just a few pages back in verse 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? Now his way is his habits, his way of life. You say, well, this is just the way I am. Well, I was born this way. Well, you know how to get that fixed? By taking heed. Now, heed is an old word. It means not just by paying attention, but by obeying. By taking heed thereto according to thy word. When you start to do things God's way, all of a sudden it changes. It just changes you. That's why every parent says to a son, you are going to do this. If, if you thought that that, and too many parents, I'm just going to get on your face for a second. Too many parents think your children are going to naturally turn out good, and they're not. Naturally, hell is in their hearts. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. You're going to have to push and pressure and chasten and get them to do right because by, by them learning to obey, do they change? Now you get them to think. You want them to understand. But you don't tell a three-year-old, well, we do this because. No, 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 no. They do it because you said so. And when they learn to obey mommy and daddy, it's the, it's the most fundamental thing for a parent to teach their child. Not for abuse, but you teach them, daddy knows what he's talking about. Daddy's right. You don't argue with mama. We're, we're going to do it this way. And when you learn to obey God, you see, man, it works. When I wait for a, a, a Christian wife, when I wait for a Christian man, when I, when I do it God's way, it's much better than doing it my way. I know too many burned out, messed up, bitter Christians who got ahead of God. And they were just too impatient. They had to get the girlfriend. They had to get the boyfriend. They had to jump and, and, and get into anything that they wanted to. And they regretted for the rest of their life. The Bible, uh, uh, this is not just an old book with religious words in it. It is the word of God and he knows what you need to do. Next thing it does is it not only changes you, it guides you. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. What does that mean? Well, I'm walking in a dark era, man. And I don't know what direction to go. I don't know what to do. I don't know whether I should take this job or not, whether I should do. I need something to guide me, and I get it from the Bible. Look at Psalm 73. Psalm 73 and verse 24. Psalm 73, 24. Thou shalt guide me with thy 
counsel. When does God counsel you as you listen to his word? See, God's not going to step down and talk to you in your sitting room or in your bedroom or at your desk. He's going to talk to you as you read the Bible. That's his words. Though it's his voice. Man lives by every word that is proceeded out of the mouth of God in your hand. And the Bible says, thou shalt guide me with thy counsel. And look at this. And afterward, you'll receive me all the way home to glory. So wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to say, God has guided me by his word. Instead of being guided by Nephet, and instead of being guided by the evolutionists and by all of the um, uh, teachers and educators that we've, we've watched people like Yo-Yo say this and then say that and all this stuff, and by all the religious hustlers out there, wouldn't it be nice to just be guided by God's word? That will guide me. That's a promise by his counsel, by his word. Um, prospers me. Go to Joshua. <clears throat> Joshua. After the book of Deuteronomy, is a book called Joshua, chapter 1 and verse 8. God is encouraging Joshua, saying, Joshua, as I was with Moses, so will I be with you. And he says, not only will I be with you, but this book is going to be with you. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. It needs to always be what you're saying is what God said. Look at that. He was a leader of a nation. God wanted him to only say what God said, not say his own opinions. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. That's a good thing to do. That thou mayest observe to do, that's obey, according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way, here's our word, prosperous. And then thou shalt have good success. Say, Pastor, why am I not having success? Because you're not doing things God's way. I know a lot of people are making a lot of money. I know a lot of people who look successful on the outside. They may have, I don't know, all the cars, all the houses. I mean, people are making money off of this uh, pandemic like, like it's a shame. There are some people that are just skyrocketed in wealth. I know this. It will go to the grave with them. It doesn't go with them anywhere past the grave. They're not a true success because in the end, their family's going to fight over that inheritance when they die. If they have any family by the time they do die. I'd rather have good success in my home. I'd rather have a good success in whatever little thing I may be doing. And I want it to be from God. If you will take this book and make it your life, God will make your way prosperous. That doesn't mean you'll have a million euros in the bank, but it'll probably mean you'll have enough to pay the bills and you might be able to take a holiday when we're finally allowed to. The book prospers you in real things. In real, and there's not one of us who wouldn't want good health, sanity, a wife who still loves you after 36 years like mine. Who wouldn't want that? And I'd rather that than a million euros. Who wouldn't want a book like the Bible? Because the way it blesses when I just obey it. Then I want to talk to you about how you need to use the Bible. Very briefly, let me just say this. Go to James chapter 1. James 1, Hebrews. <clears throat> then comes James chapter 1, verse 22. Our memory verse. And when I say use it, I mean, yes, use it. Use the Bible. Why would you, if you needed to put a nail in the wall, why would you use the heel of your shoe when you have a hammer? <laughs> why, why, why try and use a banana when you have a hammer? You see, if you have a hammer, you use it. If, you have, if your lawn, your garden needs to be mowed and you have a lawn mower, why wouldn't you use it? <laughs> so I'm going to send my son out with some scissors. All right. <laughs> That's, no, if you have a lawn mower, you use the lawn mower. If you have a Bible, you need to use it. Uh, verse 22, James chapter 1, verse 22, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. For if any man, if any be a, a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. What's a glass? A mirror. For be, he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. He's a guy. <laughs> At 99 out of 100 guys, when they come and they're real men, when they come and they see their face in a mirror, they go, perfection. They don't touch a hair. They don't fix their tie. They don't do nothing. They just pass on. All right. That's how we're wired, ladies. 
if you've got a guy who's primping himself for 45 minutes in front of the mirror, you need to pray for him, okay? But here, when you come to the Bible, that's not how you're supposed to be. If you are to the Bible like you are to a normal mirror, you're in trouble. He goes on. He says, verse 25, he says, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, that's the Bible, and continueth, continues doing it therein, he being not a forgetful hearer of what he's heard, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. You're blessed when you do the book. Uh, how about start using your Bible instead of just using what everybody else says do? Uh, use your Bible as a mirror. Let, let, let the Bible, you know, in your home, do not use the Bible as a battering ram, as a beating stick. You know, a lot of people don't come to church because they figure, oh, I'll get a lot of Bible bashing. Well, you get a lot of Bible preaching, and you might come away feeling guilty and all that stuff. Fair deuce. But I'm doing it like widespread. But can you imagine being a backslidden guy married to a woman who's trying to be spiritual, and the woman keeps throwing up Scripture in her husband's face? Well, you know what the Bible says, husband? You know, you need to be doing this, husband. Or what about turning around where the husband's trying to be spiritual and starts throwing stuff at his wife? You know, you're supposed to submit and all that stuff. That's not how the Bible was written. You know how the Bible was written? For you to look at yourself. And, and when we look into a mirror, you don't see your wife. You see yourself. So when you see David, see if that matches you. When you see Moses, see if that matches. When you see Paul, you see Peter, you see Demas, you see Mary, you see Sarah, Esther. Look and see if that's you and if there's anything that God's talking to you about. Use the Bible like a mirror. Use it as nourishment. Some of you look like prunes on the inside. Dried prune because you haven't, you haven't fed on the word in weeks. You get a little bit of a, of a taste on a Sunday and you think that'll last you for a week, it won't last 12 hours. What I teach you is something I've learned. You need to go and learn it now. So let me get up to my point here. Let it, this is, this is what God wrote. Jesus said, what I'm saying is spirit and it is life. If you'll take what I say, it will bring life to you. It will feed you. Man don't live on bread alone. You need every word, and that doesn't feed your, your bones and your, your skin and your blood. It feeds your soul and your spirit. Use the Bible to feed you. You feel weak, you feel scared, you feel full of fear, feed on the word. Use it as a weapon. Now, I'll spend a whole month on this in, in, in this year, but your Bible has the very power to defeat Satan and stop his oppressive work against you and his attacks. Um, it's the power of truth, folks. Uh, I don't know. If, uh, the Bible is called the sword of the spirit. All right. Not the hug of the spirit. Too many churches want a hug by the spirit when we need to learn the sword of it. Now, throughout history, up until the modern ages, people used to think that when there was a uh, eclipse of the sun, that a monster was up there eating it. And so they would all begin to cry out and try to scare the monster until somebody found the truth. It was the moon that just blocked it for a few minutes and it would move out of the way and move on its own path. You see, when you see today, when you see a total eclipse of the sun, you probably don't get terrified. It's awesome. I mean, I've seen probably in my lifetime four solar eclipses. They're absolutely amazing. But I haven't been terrified one time. You know why? Because I know the truth. I know what's going on. It's, there's no monsters, no aliens. There's no supernatural no it's just normal and when you know the truth it makes you free and we need to know the truth about where we're headed in the end times we need to know the truth that we can survive as a family as a church we just keep right on going we know the truth use your bible as a weapon against whatever the devil tries to scare you with use it as a perfect pattern for your life you can learn from david what not to do with your free time <laughs> I hope you get what I just said. See, David had some free time. Everybody else was out busy. And he says, you know, I'm going to go up. I know where that channel is. 
And I know what they sometimes show on that channel. They show women bathing. And so he goes up on the top roof. He didn't have a TV, but it's the equivalent. And in his free, and you need to learn what not to do with your free time. Let the Bible be a pad, show you all the patterns of how to live a good life. Let it be your source of encouragement. Let it talk to you and pick you up. Our God is good. Read Psalm 138. For the Lord is good, and His mercy endureth forever, repeats over and over and over. The list is endless. The list is endless of what, if I would use the Bible, I'll find out it works. Pray over your children, your grandchildren with the Bible. Bless them. That's what all of the Old Testament believers did. That's what Jesus did with His disciples. Last point. And as always, I could use a whole other hour. Go to Ecclesiastes, after Psalms, Proverbs, just before Isaiah, comes Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, and verse 11. A few more scriptures and I'm done. One other thing with the Word of God. I said believe it. I said obey it. You need to use it. But there's one other thought, and that is you need to patiently wait for it. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11 says this. He, God, just the first part of the verse too, just watch this. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Now, the word of God is not like an earthquake. It's not like a tornado. It's not like a bomb. Okay, when you read it, you don't get warm, fuzzy feelings all over you. The Bible is compared to a seed. How, how, how exciting is a seed? <laughs> is it jumping at you? When I was a kid, I was given a gift for my birthday of Mexican jumping beans. And they jumped. And they were fascinating, amen? I mean, you pop this thing up and thick, 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 all these beans were jumping up. I had no idea until somebody opened it up and says, there's a worm inside. You don't eat them, okay? They're called Mexican jumping beans. Now, that's, uh, that's unusual. They made those things that way, okay? They're not normally that way, I guess maybe. But the point is this. The Word of God doesn't jump. It doesn't have lights and blinks and multimedia. It's like a seed. It doesn't make any noise. It's, when it's planted, however, it comes alive. It's like, it's like a quiet voice. It's not screaming at you like your mother like your dad did when every time he was angry. No, it just talks. It's a quiet voice. It's like a trickle of water. Now, if you got any damage in your house from a storm or from a roof leak, you know a trickle of water left to go on its own will do a lot of damage over time, won't it? And the truth is that the Word of God is designed to work carefully over time, like planting a seed. You plant the seed and you don't go, all right, where's my corn? It's not like that. It takes time. So give God time. Take the hands off the clock. Don't say, all right, Lord, it's, uh, it's Sunday, 21st of February. I'll give you three days to get my wife right. <laughs> you can't do that. You can't even do it with yourself. When I first got saved, I got so frustrated after, a, I don't know, nine or ten months, I got frustrated saying, I see so many super spiritual people is what I call them because they just, they could quote the Bible. They were soul winners. There was just, they just, man, I said, I want to be just like them. One guy had the wisdom to say, you want to be just like me? You're going to have to go through all of the troubles that I've gone through too, bud. And it takes God time to put you through the furnace. And he was right. I need to just, when I, when, if I believe this Bible, if I start doing the Bible, if I start, Using the Bible, I then have to back off and let God make everything beautiful in his time. I need to trust it. I need to believe that he's going to finish the work that he began. So give God time. That means wait for it. Doesn't mean just like, now sometimes I'm waiting for, for my wife. All, right, all you gentlemen know, your wife says, I'll be ready in two minutes. 22 minutes later, all right? <laughs> Something always comes up and it's not always wrong. But the truth is this. I always have an expectation. All right, I'm going to wait two minutes before I start getting, you know. Mm. I can't do that with God. 
if I do what God says, take your Bible, I'll show you. Let's go to uh, Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. While you're turning there, I'll just quote from Psalms. Hebrews 10. Psalm 130 verse 5 says, I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait. And in his word do I hope. While I'm waiting, I'm holding on to the word of God. Uh, Hebrews 10, 36. Hebrews chapter 10. That's how come Christians are supposed to be the most patient people on the planet. Because look at Hebrews 10, 36. It says this. For ye have need of patience. You have need of patience that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. You know, if you just stay with it, if you'll just believe and just keep believing and just hold to it, God doesn't lie. Then you'll receive the promise, the benefit. You receive the effect of the word of God. Here's a man. He's called a jailer. He's the warden of, of the Philippian jail where Paul and Silas are. And you know what Paul said to the Philippian jailer when, when the jailer asked, what must I do to be saved? You know what, the, what Paul said? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou shalt be saved and your whole house. You see, the jailer couldn't get saved for his house. But when you get a man saved, he's a leader of his home. That home will follow. And you can trust that God will save all of your family. And you're just going to have to believe God. There are some people, it may take 30 years. But if you'll wait and not give up, not get bitter, God will save your family. Just wait for it. Just expect it. Because the truth is, the word of God, even though you may hand out a gospel track, you may say something, you may, may uh, uh, I don't know, teach a, a children's church class, and there are all those kids there. Maybe the one time you teach, and then a year, 10 years later, some kid comes up to you and they say, you know, that time you taught Sunday school, I got saved. And I've been living for God, and I'm getting ready to get married to a, to a Christian husband. You have no idea if you would just believe that God's word works because it already is working. You and not you know it. So I guess I'm done. But I hope you understand I'm not, I'm not just, I'm skimming the top of all of the power of the word of God. Because I want you to know it. I want you to experience it. I want you to, to realize the book you hold in your hand that's not screaming at you, is screaming at you. It's crying out, read these words. Believe them with all your heart. Do something with them. So what are you going to do? I gave you six things to do. Can you remember them? First one is to read it. Don't be like the ignorant masses who they watch all the news and they think that when the news talks about the Bible, that's all they need to know. Read it for yourself. <laughs> there was one time I was encouraged uh, uh, to, uh, to put my... Uh, there was a guy I was working with, and he was a he was a intellectual egghead, very smart. And I kind of gave him gospel tracts, and he had them right back to me. One time I asked him, "Did you ever read the Bible?" He said, "Sure, I did." I said, "You read the Bible?" He said, "Yes." I said, "Did you ever read the book of Hezekiah?" And he said, "Sure, that's one of my favorite books." <laughs> and I said, "I got gotcha. you. There is no book of Hezekiah. You haven't read the Bible. I haven't had one for you. At least the New Testament. Would you read this?" And he was embarrassed. He said, "I'll take it." You see, there, there are super intelligent people who've never read the Bible. Don't, be, don't join that group. At least read it. St I mean, two chapters a day. Get through it. Study it. When it comes to words you don't understand, pull out a dictionary. All right, it's like a man pulling out a map, all right, when he has to admit he's lost. Well, do it. And then believe it. Start believing it. Say, Lord, if your word is true, I'm going to believe it. I'm going to see I, 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 as best as I can, I'm going to believe this book. I want to see it work. God says that. God says, prove me if I will not do what I promise and then obey it. That's when the rubber will hit the road and you'll go, it's hard. That is, it's hard to love your enemy. It's hard to love other Christians even. It's hard to forgive. But if you do it, wow, I'm free. Wow, I, I've never known the ability to be able to sleep at night because you're obeying what the Bible says. Uh, use the Bible. Start using it. Not as a religious icon. Don't use it as, a, as something to beat somebody over with. Use the Bible in prayer. Use the Bible 
in your own belief, in your own trust, and in feeding and in weaponry against demonic uh, attacks, especially. And then wait while it works. I think that's a, that's a recipe for success for the Christian. And it's not complicated. It's not complicated. As you do each thing, you'll discover something new that this book can do for you in you after every one of them. You say, well, I'll read the Bible to see what happens. Well, amen, all right. As I said, you'll, 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 God will clean you out, man. That's good. But, you know, you'll, you'll, um, uh, you'll get some light in there, but it won't do the work like it can when you start studying and start learning. When he says such and such, I now see it. I now understand it. And it means something to you. But it can do nothing for you until you start reading it. And even more importantly, until you start believing it. I'll read those verses to you again. John 3, 16. God so loved the world. That's a lot of people to love. But that means he loves everyone. Can I say it? He loves you watching me and listening to me right now. He loves the whole world. And he loves and he has your name right now in the Bible that whosoever, for whosoever so, I'm sorry, I'm quoting the wrong thing. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for you. That if you, whosoever, whoever you are, would just believe in him, you would not perish, but you'll have everlasting life. You say, how do you know that? Because the Bible says it. Did you ever hear the song? Jesus loves me, this I know. Why? For the Bible tells me so. One of the most intellectual theologians of all time, he wasn't a very good Christian, but he was very intellectual. He said the greatest theology is in that song, that Jesus loves me because the Bible tells me so. What does the Bible tell you? It tells you Christ died for you, was buried and rose again just for you. If there's nobody else he died for, he died for you because he died for sinners. We ask him to save you. Say, how can I know? Because the Bible tells you. Just cry out to him with all your heart. I did 41 years ago. You can do it today. Don't, don't miss today. You'll, you'll get the gift of eternal life. Father, as we finish this, this service, God, I really want more than anything for people to see this book is not something to be had on a shelf. It's not something to be referred to it is something to be walked in and lived by and enjoyed and we're not going to enjoy it till we're doing something with it doing more than just holding it in our hands Lord, i hate electronics i hate all of the way that we've had to have church and had to have preaching but in this moment i pray i pray people have a, a hunger and a desire to open a real book Turn the pages and find the words and read the words and let them sink down deep into their heart. And let it do a work and it will do a work. It'll chisel away. Oh, it won't change us instantly. But it will save us in a moment if we would believe it. And it will bring light in where there's nothing but, been nothing but darkness. Would somebody just believe it. And would Christians just believe it again and let it and use it, turn it loose in our home, in our mouth, in our hearts. Lord, may this, this message be what we need it today. In Jesus' name, amen.